what we're really trying to achieve with this global conference, I think, is a couple of things. First of all, we want to build partnerships between countries. So we want countries to get ideas of how they can work together on a bilateral basis, maybe on a regional basis, or maybe, hopefully, even on a global basis. So that's one thing that we're trying to achieve. We also want to inspire countries. We're showing so many different finance solutions. We hope that you get new ideas and knowledge about what you can do in your countries. And the third thing we want is we want to provide a platform for you to share your ideas. So we really hope that each of you finds a little spot somewhere in the agenda in some session to share some knowledge from your country. So that's, those are actually three very simple ideas that are behind this conference and uh, we developed a quite elaborate program around that. And uh, we hope that we can uh, achieve those and we want to hear back to you at the end of the workshop on how we did on that. So back over to you, uh, Gillian. Great. Thank you very much, Anno. I'd like to just go over very high level the agenda for the next couple of days. So you've all seen the agenda, but there are some special features to note. So today we've had our opening session. We've had some context setting in the opening plenary. As I mentioned, we've got some introductions here in a moment, and then we've got our first of the high level panel on public finance. After lunch, we go into a series of parallel sessions. So you might have noticed on the agenda that we have six of these sessions. So over the next three days, there are 24 parallel sessions on offer to you. So the hard, your hard work is to try to choose amongst those four, uh, amongst the four during each one of the sessions. They're organized in streams. So stream one is implementing finance solutions of scale. The second stream is on unlocking private sector finance flows. The third stream is about piloting innovative financing solutions. And the fourth stream is looking at the Biofin methodology. The fourth stream is of particular interest to countries that are new to the Biofin family. So those are going to be really introductory sessions that will be very useful for those countries who are just coming in to get support. So those are the four streams. We have breakout rooms. So there are three breakout rooms. They're out there in the building, so they're not very far away. Um, and this room is also going to be one of the four. You need to look at the schedule to see in which room, obviously, the parallel sessions are. Only the sessions in this room will have the translation. So if translation is something you're looking for, those in this room, and there are different ones in different streams, um, but you just need to look. How many of you have been able to download the app already? Have some of you? Okay. Yeah, that's definitely a useful way of keeping on top of where things are, announcements, what's going on, etc. So you might want to look into that. In a moment, I'm going to tell you more about hashtags and things, but we had some questions this morning about the Wi-Fi. I put the Wi-Fi password and the username over on the board. It's very simple. It's just Biofin, small letters for both the username and the password. However, Whenever we have a panel session up here, we turn the Wi-Fi off because we're live streaming. And the bandwidth is not enough to let everybody be on Twitter and do the live streaming. So apologies for that, but you won't have Wi-Fi um, when we're actually doing something up here. But you should have it now. So do you have Wi-Fi now? Yes, most of you? Those who want it? Oh, OK, that sounds good. So I wanted to mention that. So day one, um, we're going to, after lunch, go into those parallel sessions. And we won't reconvene in plenary uh, today. So tomorrow, we actually have two interesting panel discussions here in the morning. So we'll come together at 9 o'clock. That'll take us up to the coffee break. And then we have two sets of parallel sessions before and after lunch. And then at the end of tomorrow, we've got our biodiversity finance solutions marketplace. So I wanted to say a couple words about that. I'll do that in a moment because I've got another slide. But the marketplace has a lot of other interactive features. And so that's something that's going to be going on tomorrow at the end of the day. And our third day will start with parallel sessions. We then have a community of practice open space because first and foremost, these three days are really for you all. It's a community meeting, as Anno said, to share, exchange, learn from each other. And so that open space is going to be a time when you're going to program the discussion. So you get to propose what we talk about. 
We then go into stream sessions and have a closing session at the end. So that's our three days. Knowledge sharing happens in a lot of different ways. You do it at coffee breaks. But uh, we do have a poster exhibition. So in the marketplace area, um, the marketplace is also an, a time when it's going to be a structured and even some semi-structured opportunities for sharing and exchange. We'll tell you more about that um, just before we get there. And there's also the community open space, which I mentioned. I'm going to pause for a minute now and draw your attention to something on all of your tables. So every table has two small cards. And these cards are for you to propose an open space discussion if you would like to. This is completely voluntary. But if you have an idea and you would like to host a table conversation for 45 minutes on any topic, any question you have, an idea you want some feedback on, a proposal you're trying to develop, an existential question you're grappling with, you know, you can fill out this card. The card asks you for a topic, just what you would title your session. It asks for a short description, so just a couple of lines. And it asks for a host. So if you're writing something down, you need to host it or co-host it with somebody else. Um, but you can't propose that somebody else has a session. You have to be one of the hosts. If you would like to do this, please fill this out in the next two days. Our open space is on day three. And make sure you give me your card. So we have 31 tables in the room. So we can have 62 concurrent small discussions. So please uh, give us your ideas if you'd like to do that. So I took, wanted to take a moment and uh, share with you how that was going to be working. Some of the other features, we've seen some people congregating at the finance solutions wall. So the wall has the list of finance solutions. And if your country is interested in learning more about any of those, there are some markers there. And we'd like to ask you to write your country name in the box beside the solution. And that's something that we'll follow up with after the conference. And you can sign up for as many as you like. You just put your country name up there. Um, and it will be going for the next three days. We also have a photo competition, and some of you might have seen the photos exhibited outside, really beautiful photos, and we'll be announcing the winners of the competition during the marketplace tomorrow, so you want to have a look at that. Refreshments are special features. We are going to, at the end of the marketplace, have a, a cocktail reception, so that's tomorrow afternoon. And then I already mentioned the app. There's also, on the upper right-hand corner, the three hashtags that we're using. Are any of you tweeting? Do we have some tweeters? So we've got some people. Great. So we'd ask you to have a look at those hashtags and, and use those. And we'll be able to track what you're writing and hopefully get a lot of promotion. That, those are global, so we might have people from outside the meeting who are tweeting back at us. So it'll be interesting to hear the kind of conversations that are happening. All right. So. That's what's going on um, for the next couple of days. There are a lot of activities that are going to be all the way through, the wall of solutions, the photo competition, et cetera. But there are also some very specific events, like the marketplace, the open space, for which um, we'll have a chance of doing that sharing and exchanging. The community, as I mentioned, we have 220 or so people with us. And so we wanted to take a moment and just see who's in the room. And what I'd like to ask, I'm going to go through a couple of different categories of people. And I'd like you to stand up so we can just see you and recognize you. And I'd like to start with the regions. So if you are coming from Southeast Asia Pacific region, could you please stand up so we can see who's here from that part of the world? We should have a number of people all spread out. Great. Oh, quite a few. Wonderful. Welcome to all of you, Southeast Asia and Pacific. Happy to have you with us. If you're coming from Asia or Central Asia, could you please stand up? So you decide which category you fit in. <laughs> all right. Also, big group. Welcome to all of you. We're here with you in your region. Um, if you're coming from Africa, could you please stand up? I have some colleagues. This is a long trip for many of you. Great. Wonderful. Welcome. And from Latin America and the Caribbean. Where are groups from? Ah, oh, big group. Excellent. 
Excellent, great. And so, rest of the world, anybody here from any place else? So we should have some Europeans, North Americans. Great, okay, welcome. So these are the different regions we have, and you can see kind of how many people are coming from each one. We also have a lot of different sectors. This is a very diverse group in terms of sector. Again, you can stand up more than once. Many of you probably have multiple hats on, even at this, in this um, particular event. So if you're working for government at any level, from local to national, please could you stand up, our government colleagues. Great, welcome, oh, lots. Wonderful, big group. If you're working for NGOs or the civil society, could you stand up? We have some people from, uh, okay, welcome. <laughs> what about the private sector? So we have some colleagues here, certainly from the private sector, we've got a panel on that. Welcome, great, I see you back there. University and academia. We should have a number of people who are coming. Excellent. Um, what about the media? Some people representing the media? Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Um, it, that included social media, so then many of us would stand up. Any other sectors that I didn't call? UN, intergovernmental. So what about our UN colleagues? Oh, this was... This is a big group. Excellent. Okay. So we've got regions, we've got sectors. Um, we also have people with different roles. So if you're a Biofin country focal point, could you stand up? So we've got focal points from all the countries. I'm sure we have more than one, no? One country focal point? You're just shy. All right, there we go. <laughs> we should have focal points for all the countries and we're gonna hear, be hearing from you tomorrow. Great, okay, so welcome to our focal points. Um, we've also got a number of experts. So if you're a Biofin expert, so this can take a lot of different forms, but could you stand up if you're an expert? So you're probably someone who's going to be giving a parallel session, you feed into the thematic discussions, etc. Okay, great, thanks to our experts. Experts have been working very hard in preparing this meeting and so have the Biofin staff members. So could I ask you to stand up if you're on the Biofin staff, and the global team, would you stand up so we can especially give you a hand? Right, they're all spread out. Great, excellent, thank you very much. If you have ever attended a Biofin global or regional workshop before, could you please stand up? So let's see how many people have been to some of the other Biofin regional or global. Okay. Great. Okay. So actually, yeah, we have quite a few people who, who stood up there. Let me just break it down a little bit. Who's been, who went to the first Biofin? Um, it was in, where was it? Slovakia, Bratislava. Who was in Bratislava? We have a few people who were in Bratislava. That was the first one. So, okay. So you guys have been here since since the beginning. What about the Los Cabos uh, meeting? Who was in Mexico with us a couple years ago? I'm standing up for this one too. So we have a number of people who were in Mexico. All right. Now I'd like you to look around you at some of the other tables. How many of you know everybody sitting at all the tables around you? No, okay. I'm gonna give you three minutes to look around you and introduce yourself to a few people around you that you don't know. So do that now. Look around you, stand up, shake hands, tell them who you are. So you meet a few other people right now.
Okay, thank you. So you got to meet a couple of other people that you didn't know before. Go ahead and have a seat again. <laughs> For 220 people, you won't have time to meet everybody. So you have to use the coffee breaks and the lunch times for that. Let's go on. If I could ask you to please take a seat. So you see what kind of an interesting community of people you have to work with for the next couple of days. We're going to go on now, maybe, if uh, people can have a seat. Oh, this is very exciting to meet everybody else. The second part of our session is, actually has a very provocative title. Did you notice what it was called? It's called The Secrets of Public Financing for biodiversity. And I'd like to invite, shh, just a moment. Oh, right. So I'd like to invite our moderator to come forward. Max Riva is the Innovation Finance Specialist at UNDP in New York, and he's going to be the moderator for the panel. So let me give the floor now to Max. Thank you and uh, welcome to everyone to one of the first uh, thematic session uh, and indeed uh, the, the, um, the title is quite ambitious and, but it's so important to start understanding the, um, the value of public finance in protecting our biodiversity and natural assets. Uh, in the, through the conference and uh, through the different interactions, we will look at different elements of partnership with the private sector on private finance, but we should always remind of the role of our government and our public and treasury in supporting the environment. Uh, we have a very distinguished panelist, panel with us today, um, and I will, uh, um, I will uh, uh, soon call them to join, uh, to join me for this, uh, uh, for this interesting session. Uh, let me first uh, um, ask uh, Dr. Rodolfo Lessi from Mexico uh, to, join, uh, to join our panel. <laughs> Dr. Rodolfo is the Deputy Minister of Planning and uh, Environmental Policy uh, in Mexico, Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources, uh, Semanat. He holds a PhD in Science and Environmental Engineering from Metropolitan Autonomous University in Mexico and a Master in Environmental Planning from, uh, from the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is the founding president of the Environmental Engineer Association of Mexico, former head of advisors of, to the Minister of Environment in Mexico and research coordinator for energy and environment projects at the Mario Molina Center. Uh, he also was previously the general director for prevention and control of environmental pollution at the Mexico City government. Thanks for joining us. Let me also uh, call up on, um, on, on the panel uh, Mr. Ulumbek Kar Karmishakov from the Kyrgyz Republic. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Karmishakov is the deputy minister of finance of the Kyrgyz Republic. He assumed the position of Deputy Minister in uh, 2015. Uh, Mr. Kalmyshakov has more than 30 years of experience at the Ministry of Finance and held many positions, including Head of Department of Finance and Budget Control and Audit, as well as Head of Budget Policy and Expenditure. He was awarded an honorary award of Financial and Economic Service of the Kyrgyz Republic. He, we are also very proud he chairs the National Project Board of Biofin in the Kyrgyz Republic. Thank you for joining us. Um, let, me, um, let me then invite uh, our colleague uh, from, uh, from South Africa, Dimpo Makotoko. Um, uh, Dimpo Makotoko is the Chief Operations Officer for the Department of Environmental Affairs in South Africa. Um, she is oversees South African National Sustainable Development and Greening Policy processes and initiatives. She is responsible for the oversight of the environmental sector, performance management, and overall coordination along all spheres of government. Her background is in business and performance management. Let us welcome um, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Dimpo Makoto. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce also our uh, last panelist, uh, last but not least, uh, Juan Ladron de Guevara. He's the executive director of the Chilean Sustainability and Climate Change Agency. 
please join uh, uh, the panel. Um, uh, Joan is uh, the executive director of the uh, Chilean Climate Change Agency, which, was, which has the mission to foster a sustainable, low carbon and resilient economy. Uh, through private, private, uh, pub, private and public partnerships, uh, the agency was previously known as the Chilean National Clean Production Council, and uh, um, uh, Juan was the, uh, was the former executive director. He is also an adjunct professor at the University of Chile, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll engage him particularly on uh, public and private uh, engagement. So let, uh, let us welcome him. Um, thank you, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, and to joining us on this first uh, uh, discussion. Um, uh, the topic is well known, and is uh, how to harness uh, uh, public finance in different forms for the service of the biodiversity agenda. Um, I, will, uh, I will give you uh, first a chance of a brief introduction of your main theme and, uh, and a suggestion on how to uh, unveil the secrets of public finance. We have a, a very mixed uh, 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 audience here. We have uh, uh, colleagues from the Ministry of, um, of uh, Finance, from the Ministry of Environment, and other sectors, as well as uh, private uh, uh, companies and representatives of international organizations. So let me first um, uh, uh, address the floor um, uh, to you, Dr. Rodolfo, uh, to provide us uh, of a brief introduction on the importance uh, um, development in Mexico, and particularly in relation to the SDGs. Mexico has been one of the forerunners on budgeting for the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to speak in Spanish. Uh, please take your headphones. Bien. Uh, Con respecto al financiamiento sobre biodiversidad, en México nosotros eh, hemos tenido una larga tradición de manejo de la biodiversidad a través de programas públicos. Eh, entonces, básicamente, eh, hay una corriente de financiamiento eh, con presupuesto eh, del gobierno federal que a veces se soporta también con presupuesto de gobiernos locales y un complemento por lo general de organismos o de instituciones filantrópicas. En realidad eh, es todavía eh, muy incipiente el financiamiento que de manera franca se hace desde el sector privado. Para efectos prácticos ahora de Eh, los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, lo que estamos haciendo es un cambio en la legislación, que es parte del secreto de que los burócratas le dediquemos dinero a un tema, cualquiera que este sea el tema. ¿sí? Entonces, nuestra Secretaría de Hacienda, que es como la Secretaría del Tesoro, el Ministerio del Tesoro, eh, ha decidido modificar una ley que es fundamental en la Eh, designación de metas y objetivos, que es la Ley de Planeación Democrática. Entonces, nuestra Ley de Planeación Democrática no menciona en la actualidad que tenemos un objetivo de largo plazo, sino solamente indica que todos los sectores, el gobierno federal, pero el sector transporte, el sector agricultura, el sector del medio ambiente, deben tener programas que duran seis años, que es lo que dura en México una administración. El presidente tiene seis años de mandato. Entonces, para poder tener objetivos de largo plazo, o sea, para poder adoptar una agenda del 2030, es necesario modificar la ley. Y estamos en ese proceso de modificar la ley. Una vez que modifiquemos la ley, nosotros entonces incorporamos las metas de los objetivos de desarrollo los indicadores numéricos y esos objetivos entonces se vuelven parte de nuestros programas de trabajo de una manera obligatoria porque ahorita pues son de una manera voluntaria para el funcionario público se volverían de una manera obligatoria eh, hay que hay que ser también realistas todos nosotros estamos convencidos de que el tema de la biodiversidad es transversal 
y que toca prácticamente todas las actividades eh, humanas que un gobierno regula o todas las iniciativas que la sociedad en su conjunto tiene. Si hablamos de algodón o si hablamos este, de agua, etcétera, sabemos que detrás de eh, los objetos tenemos a la biodiversidad. La podemos usar de manera directa, ¿no? es el caso del algodón, o de manera indirecta al impactarla por el procesamiento de combustibles fósiles. ¿sí? Entonces, una pregunta fundamental es ¿cuánto gastamos en biodiversidad? Que es un tema transversal. Bueno, para poder saber eso, en nuestro país, en México, necesitamos tener un mandato de ley. Ahorita, por ejemplo, tenemos un mandato de ley para saber cuánto gastamos en grupos indígenas, cuánto gastamos en asuntos de género de la mujer y cuánto gastamos en asuntos de cambio climático. Entonces, si alguien le pregunta a nuestro presidente o a cualquier funcionario público cuánto gastamos en esos tres temas, podemos dar una cifra. Entonces, yo puedo decir, gastamos en cambio climático en el presupuesto federal 70 mil millones este, de pesos. Pero si me preguntan cuánto gastamos en biodiversidad, no lo puedo contestar, porque no tengo por mandato de ley eh, la obligación de etiquetar el presupuesto para biodiversidad. ¿sí? Entonces, para poderlo hacer, estamos introduciendo los objetivos de desarrollo sustentable. Pero hay que ser pragmáticos. ¿sí? Los objetivos de desarrollo sustentable, los 17, eh, no hablan todos de biodiversidad. De hecho, no incorporan la palabra biodiversidad más que en los objetivos 14 y 15. Entonces, nosotros tenemos que de manera indirecta introducir el concepto de biodiversidad en el diseño de las políticas públicas de los demás objetivos. ¿Cuántos objetivos hablan de manera directa o indirecta del de medio ambiente que está relacionado con la biodiversidad? No son muchos, por eso digo que hay que ser pragmáticos. Son 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Entonces, si un funcionario público que se dedica a la pobreza le dicen, oye, ¿cuánto le dedicas tú a biodiversidad? Va a decir, bueno, no tengo el mandato. Yo sé cuánto le estoy metiendo, por ejemplo, a la adaptación en ecosistemas para que los pobres no sufran los embates de los desastres naturales. ¿Sí? Entonces, si alguien está gastando dinero en proteger los manglares, en donde vive también gente, para que los huracanes no impacten a las comunidades costeras, pues eso es una ecuación de tres incógnitas y es difícil de contestar. Entonces, sí vamos a tener que desarrollar nosotros indicadores que, son, que van más allá de los indicadores que hemos pactado para los ODS, que hablen específicamente de diversidad, para contestar la pregunta sencilla de cuánto gastamos en biodiversidad. Biofin nos ha estado ayudando en contestar esa pregunta, pero a futuro pues vamos a tener que tener muchas más herramientas de política pública y de planeación. Nuestro enfoque es el que está, estoy yo ahorita comentando, es modificar la ley para que sea obligatorio poder contestar esa pregunta. Muchas gracias. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, several important elements of that can be considered secrets <laughs> are somehow well known, <laughs> but they never need to be forgotten. And uh, sometimes it's not sufficient to collect just data, but without main mandates, policies, and uh, um, um, uh, leadership uh, engagement, uh, it might not be possible to uh, achieve positive results. Let me pass to another country, which is. Uh, in Central Asia, um, uh, Deputy Minister, um, what has been uh, the experience of, uh, of Kyrgyzstan and, uh, in uh, planning and in mainstreaming biodiversity in economic policy? Спасибо, Максимилиано. Во-первых, я хотел бы поприветствовать всех участников глобальной конференции от имени кыргызской делегации. Кыргызстан – это красивая горная страна, которая находится в Центральной Азии территорию которого более 95% это горы, очень красивые горы, очень много рек и э, озер. 
Еще раз, уважаемые друзья, я хотел бы вот обсуждать с вами, поделиться тем опытом, который есть у нас в Кыргызстане в части финансирования государственного финансирования биоразнообразия и экосистем. К сожалению, как всегда финансисты говорят, всегда денег не хватает. У правительства, конечно, очень много приоритетных направлений, но тем не менее на финансирование экосистем биоразнообразия в нашей стране выделяется менее 1% общих расходов государственного бюджета, к сожалению. Если быть точнее, то 0,16% от общих расходов. Поэтому это мы считаем, конечно, недостаточным. В первую очередь мы должны не просто вот сохранять для наших потомков, но мы должны улучшить состояние, создать условия по дальнейшему развитию именно охраны окружающей среды, нашего биоразнообразия. Вот поэтому наше правительство тоже вот в прошлом году мы приняли стратегический документ, рассчитанный на 5 лет 2017 по 2022 год. Это называется Джана Дорго Каркадан, то есть 40 шагов э, к, новому, <coughs> к новой эпохе. И одним из э, направлений, основных направлений вот этого стратегического документа является именно э, уделение большого внимания э, э, нашей экологической системы и охраны окружающей среды, лесного хозяйства в целом э, этого комплекса. Э, поэтому э, и не просто э, принимать вот такие, э, такие нормативные правовые акты, а надо э, доказывать конкретными шагами. Если вот взять, к примеру, э, то правительство Кыргызстана в прошлом году мы приняли э, меры по увеличению заработной платы, э, совершенствованию системы условий оплаты труда именно работников э, лесного хозяйства, охраны окружающей среды. То есть это создать, создать э, стимул для э, усиления работы вот именно работников этого сектора, как раз э, о чем мы здесь э, говорим, вот проблема по сохранению э, биоразнообразия. Э, вот э, впереди выступающая вот, э, с банка ЕС, э, по-моему, госпожа Намета сказала, что в Индии есть хороший пример по финансированию частным банкам, вот именно той проблемы, о которой мы, э, мы обсуждаем. К сожалению, у нас такого пока еще нет, но э, наши, э, наш парламент принял очень хороший закон, который называется э, закон о ГЧП, то есть о государственно-частном предпринимательстве, по которому есть у нас желающие, сейчас вот мой коллега там, э, Спрон Кумар тоже подтвердил об этом, что есть желающие хорошие инвесторы частные, которые хотят, хотят вложить именно в этот сектор частные инвестиции. Поэтому, уважаемые друзья, если что, приезжайте в Кыргызстан, можете вложить, мы создадим все условия по защите ваших инвестиций, по развитию ваших инвестиций, именно направленных на сохранение охраны окружающей среды. Также я хотел бы отметить, что бюджетных денег, как я уже говорил, всегда недостаточно Поэтому э, мы должны еще э, привлечь для финансирования вот этой системы э, международных доноров. Да, э, спасибо вот, экспертам Биофин, э, вы оказываете большую э, помощь э, правительству Кыргызстана и в целом для э, населения Кыргызстана, оказываете, оказываете всяческую поддержку в разработке вот этих э, программ, э, в рамках которого у нас существует несколько программ, по э, тому же э, проект у нас по сохранению снежного барса, который про, э, проходил в прошлом году у нас в Кыргызстане э, в сентябре, если я не изменяю память. Э, также, э, как я уже говорил, вот, привлечение частных инвесторов. 
Поэтому еще раз я хотел бы, уважаемые друзья, вот, э, призвать всю вот эту команду, команду э, экспертов Биофин э, еще раз усилить. Вы делаете огромную работу, огромную работу, которая не имеет цены, потому что к 2025-2030 году будут очень большие проблемы по э, заключению экспертов, по, особенно по чистой воде. Э, например, э, у нас если в Кыргызстане имеется более 1500 э, ледников, то последние 10 лет э, количество вот этих ледников у нас э, резко э, сократилось, уменьшается, к сожалению, хотя мы являемся на э, так, истоке вот этих больших рек, которые подпитывают Центральный Азиатский регион, это Узбекистан, это уже вот Казахстан. Поэтому это является тоже большой опасностью. Вот именно. Поэтому еще раз, уважаемые друзья, давайте еще раз усилим и оставим нашим, нашему следующему поколению, нашим детям, внукам, не просто вот, э, то, что есть у нас, а наоборот, приумножать, приумножив, приукрасив э, и создав э, те нормативно-правовые условия для развития нашего биоразнообразия. Благодарю вас за внимание. Спасибо. Ms. Um, Makotoko, South Africa is often considered one of the leaders in the conservation space, so we are very eager to hear what will be your suggestions and uh, your remarks uh, in, uh, in this interesting uh, subject area. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for, uh, for that. Uh, I'm not sure about the leadership uh, role, but I think there are a few ideas we can share, but we also look forward to learning a bit more ourselves. Um, uh, South Africa, for us, we view biodiversity as an integral part of SDG implementation. So, because we're saying our biodiversity economy contributes to a number of SDGs uh, relating to poverty alleviation, human health, effective management of biodiversity activities. So on the basis of that, we do see a lot of benefits that we can derive from the biofin process because we are struggling currently on uh, the total cost or, or deciding or getting the figure or the total cost of managing biodiversity and understanding what then is the shortfall. If, if we look at the areas that we are currently funding, what is the existing shortfall? We currently have uh, the expanded public uh, sector program, which basically looks at different uh, biodiversity management programs that also contribute to job creation, skills development, which we hope will also assist in this regard. I will later on talk to just a brief, uh, to give you a brief understanding of some of the programs that we are looking at as part of our, of our Biofin uh, project. So if we look at what are some of the benefits that we wish to derive, from uh, the Biofin uh, partnership. We're saying it needs to assist us uh, to start to systematically prioritize resources and activities uh, that are in our existing national biodiversity strategy and action plan so that we then have adequate funding uh, for those initiatives and programs that we have. But we also feel that Biofin would need to then link with global discussions uh, on natural capital accounts and mainstreaming biodiversity into production sectors uh, because we see that as a potential source of uh, revenue for sustainable use of biodiversity. We are hoping that we will be able to at least get a uniform framework with using the, uh, the process, a uniform framework for, assisti for assessing the costs of managing biodiversity while at the same time creating the sufficient flexibility that we all require in our different contexts. Because for us as South Africa, when we look at our context, we have looked at three pillars. And our first pillar has been on uh, financing solutions for protected areas, where we're looking at expanding our conservation estate as a starting uh, point. We also have an area around ecosystem restoration, 
and our priority there is on biodiversity offsets. We are also looking at uh, sustainable use of resources. The initial focus, which we hope to still expand on, is around certification schemes for wildlife economy. Uh, as I've indicated, we currently have a finance plan, which has uh, 16 uh, solutions. It's currently now be, uh, on the final stages of approval for implementation. I hope you'll give me an opportunity to come back and share a, a, lit, a bit more details on some of the areas that we're looking at financing on. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Ladron Guevara, so with this uh, initial uh, uh, round of, uh, of talks and reflections, um, you are in a very uh, particular seat in the sense that you uh, are uh, between the public and private sector in addressing problems using economic instruments and financial instruments. So it will be very interesting to see your, um, your reflection on, um, on those topics and, uh, and uh, learn from uh, your experience. Thank you. Hello, hello. <coughs> yeah. I will also speak in, in Spanish, so please put your headphone. El <coughs> bueno, muchas gracias, Max, uh, y al equipo global por la invitación. Eh, yo voy a... El, el secreto que quiero eh, eh, compartir con ustedes es la, se refiere a las alianzas público-privadas. Eh, Chile es un país que hace más o menos 30 años eh, viene, viene, eh, tiene un liderazgo importante en Latinoamérica eh, en materia económica y uno de los pilares de ese liderazgo tiene que ver con la capacidad de atraer eh, o, o movilizar recursos, atraer inversiones hacia objetivos de la política pública como un, como un, obje, como un pilar eh, fundamental. Eh, las alianzas público-privadas, por lo tanto, son un instrumento económico en el sentido de que son mecanismos eh, para eh, invitar al sector privado a que invierta o que, o que eh, destine recursos hacia objetivos de política eh, importantes para el, para el gobierno. El caso, yo diría que los casos más conocidos de alianzas público-privadas son los, los mecanismos de eh, concesiones de de, de, de eh, 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 obras públicas, de, eh, por ejemplo, la construcción de una carretera en que uno invita a un inversionista privado a que, a, a que, a, a que construya la, la obra y luego tiene un mecanismo de recuperación de la inversión a través del de pago de los peajes, por ejemplo, de la, de la autopista por 10, 20, 30 años. Lo que la agencia que yo dirijo hace es otro tipo de alianza público-privada, eh, en, en que lo que nosotros buscamos es que las empresas eh, implementen nuevas tecnologías, eh, en este caso tecnologías ambientales, ¿eh? tecnologías verdes. Eh, pero tiene la misma lógica, es un, es un proceso en que nosotros eh, eh, colaboramos en identificar cuáles son las barreras que las empresas tienen y ayudamos a que ellas eh, hagan inversión directa en, en esas tecnologías. Cuando hablo de tecnología estoy hablando de eh, inversiones en activos, por lo tanto re recursos significativos, o también eh, la adopción de, 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 de mejores prácticas en, en determinados eh, sectores. Por ejemplo, eh, in introducir manejo sustentable de los bos del bosque nativo, eh, introducir sustentabilidad tecnologías de sustentabilidad en la agricultura. Chile es un país exportador muy importante. Eh, introducir eh, mejoras tecnológicas en el sector turismo, eh, o en el sector pesquero o acuícola. O sea, que son todos sectores donde estas tecnologías tienen o pueden tener un efecto significativo en, en, la, en, 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 los efect en el medio ambiente y en particular en, en la biodiversidad. ¿Cómo el, yo diría, ¿Cuál es el, el principal elemento para... O sea, ¿Cómo uno administra una política de alianzas público-privadas? Esto se parece mucho más a, a manejar un, un portafolio de alianzas. O sea, 
cada sector, un, una alianza con el sector forestal, por ejemplo, para introducir eh, una, 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 una forma de manejo sustentable de los bosques, es muy, eh, eh, tiene especificidades que son distintas de las que yo requiero para hacerlo con la agricultura, con el sector turismo, con el sector de obras públicas, o el sector de manufactura, etc. Entonces, la, acá no hay una receta, eh, no hay un método único, no hay un, el instrumento no es uno solo para todos los sectores, sino que es, es más bien un, una, una visión, un método general que yo lo adapto a cada uno de los, de los casos donde yo quiero trabajar. Por eso eh, la agencia en la que, trabaja, que yo trabajo es eh, más bien es un es una administramos un, un pool de un portafolio de, de alianza no, del orden de hoy en día, después de casi 20 años de, de experiencia, del orden de 160 eh, alianzas público-privadas que ya están implementadas o en proceso de implementación en, en todos los sectores de la economía. Eh, eso, yo, yo quiero, quiero parar hasta aquí, el, más adelante voy a contar que es algunos ejemplos, pero me interesa más bien el, el concepto de que las alianzas público-privadas finalmente son mecanismos en que el Estado invita o moviliza al sector privado para que invierta directamente en objetivos que, que, que le interesan al, al gobierno. En este caso, lo que nos convoca es la, el, el la biodiversidad. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Vice Minister, um, you, uh, you mentioned in your first uh, um, intervention some of the preconditions or necessary elements for um, for uh, um, helping to mainstream biodiversity in uh, economic policy and financing. And uh, we, we know that the, the President Office initiative uh, with budgeting of the SDGs of, for the, and of other opportunities that uh, um, uh, have been offered to the environmental sector to, uh, to be more active and more proactive. So what is, what do you think, how would you describe these opportunities and what you would you suggest in terms of uh, uh, taking the best uh, uh, efforts and, and, and make an advancement in uh, uh, mainstreaming biodiversity in the financing and economic policies? What, um, and, and, and as you might have, uh, we are switching a bit from on languages, so uh, a bit of patience on that, uh, but uh, please uh, and, uh, go okay. ahead. Thank you, Minister. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the question, because uh, mainstreaming uh, was launched as an initiative in, of, of Mexico in the COP13. Uh, voy a hablar en, es, en español, sorry. Uh, I'm going to speak in, in, in English, in, in Spanish. Uh, para, para, para México es muy importante que el tema de biodiversidad sea uh, un tema intrínsecamente importante y estratégico en aquellos sectores que usan la biodiversidad para generar riqueza. La agricultura, la ganadería, eh, las actividades forestales y en particular el turismo. ¿no? Entonces, nosotros tenemos eh, eh, este principio de actuación eh, y quisiéramos ver que esos sectores no utilicen dinero para hacer un uso indebido y no sustentable de la biodiversidad. Y si tienen dinero, que no den subsidios a aquellas actividades que pueden dañar la biodiversidad y que, en cambio, utilicen ese dinero para financiar proyectos en donde la biodiversidad sea un tema central, pero también sea parte de pues, un nuevo... Eh, paradigma o una nueva forma de hacer negocio, de crear riqueza en estos sectores. Pero tenemos también un mandato en los SDGs, por ejemplo, los SDGs sí nos hablan claramente los objetivos de desarrollo sustentable del sector turismo, pero nos dicen, oye, tienes que conservar la biodiversidad en los océanos. También eh, pesquerías es parte de, de esta... esta eh, iniciativa de México en la COP13 hace un año y medio. Tienes que conservar la biodiversidad en, las, en los cuerpos de agua dulce, porque ahí hemos perdido una muy buena parte de la biodiversidad acuática. Entonces, ¿cómo conservamos eh, la biodiversidad en los océanos? Es relativamente fácil imaginarlo, 
si por ejemplo en áreas naturales protegidas podemos mantener los semilleros, si es que los pudiéramos llamar así, de aquellas especies que son objetivo de pesca, el atún, ¿no? eh, por poner solamente un ejemplo, los camarones, eh, pero qué especies son especies objetivos en términos productivos en aguas este, continentales, en los cuerpos de agua, ¿sí? las truchas, por poner un, un ejemplo, tal vez eh, hay al, algunas otras especies, pero son economías menores comparadas con las del mar, entonces nos cuesta más trabajo o nos va a costar más trabajo cumplir el objetivo de desarrollo sustentable para eh, fresh water, pero también nos dicen, bueno, tienes que conservar la biodiversidad específicamente en las montañas, eso nos dice los SDGs, ¿sí? volviendo a la parte práctica de nuestro quehacer como gobierno, pues nosotros tenemos que diseñar políticas públicas para que protegiendo la biodiversidad que hay en las montañas, ¿sí? podamos literalmente ayudar a las gentes que viven en las montañas a tener una economía sustentable. Eh, ¿Quién puede financiar, y eso es una pregunta este, difícil a veces de contestar, ¿quién puede financiar la protección de la biodiversidad en las montañas haciendo negocios, APPs como nos, nos sugiere nuestro colega de Chile? ¿no? Los suizos, ¿no? cuando hacen este, resorts ¿sí? o ecolodge, eh, o aquellos que de alguna manera están en el negocio turístico, en el negocio forestal, eh, incorporar nuevas prácticas que de alguna manera nos ayuden a, a la parte eh, de protección de las montañas. Pero en particular quiero eh, comentar algo que los SDG nos mandatan y que es diversificar eh, la industria y diversificar nuestro consumo. Nosotros literalmente comemos muy pocas especies y explotamos muy pocas especies para los objetos de la vida cotidiana. ¿Sí? Entonces, eh, hay pocas culturas que tienen esta gran diversidad en el manejo de, la, de, de, de las especies como la India, por ejemplo, ¿no? como, como China. En México también tenemos una gran amplitud del uso de la biodiversidad para, para la, la generación del bienestar colectivo. Entonces, nosotros tenemos este otro mandato de diversificar, y al diversificar, pues tendríamos que usar, hacer un uso mayor de la biodiversidad. Ahí hay un riesgo, pero también hay una oportunidad de negocio. Y eso lo quiero poner en, en particular eh, eh, en como un, punto, un foco rojo, porque normalmente para combatir la pobreza, lo que nosotros usamos son los assets o digamos lo que los pobres tienen en su entorno inmediato, la mayor parte de nuestras poblaciones pobres sí viven en zonas rurales todavía y ahí es la biodiversidad quien los puede sacar de la pobreza, entonces buscar un financiamiento sustentable para sacar de la pobreza a la gente haciendo un uso de la biodiversidad, un uso más sustentable también es uno de los retos que nos plantean los SDGs. Entonces, eh, Finalmente, el último mensaje que yo quisiera decir es que nos mandata también los SDGs establecer vínculos positivos con sectores urbanos y rurales. Normalmente hay vínculos negativos, ¿no? las ciudades se vuelven sumideros de materiales, de biodiversidad, de energía, de todo. Y nosotros tenemos que establecer, además de vínculos positivos en aquellos sectores productivos que generan riqueza con la biodiversidad, vínculos positivos en aquellos sectores que están ligados tradicionalmente de una manera depredadora. Y ese vínculo positivo que debe existir entre la, la ciudad y los aspectos rurales también requiere de financiamiento para cambiar la forma de hacer negocio. Hasta ahí lo dejo. Muchas gracias. And um, continuing, of course, you understand the complexity, like those secrets of public finance for biodiversity are not, may not simple ones. Like we, we, we see the private and public uh, engagement, we do see the different ecosystems, we do see the different sectors. And um, uh, it's not easy to, uh, to bring the dif those different elements together. Uh, but uh, now I want to, um, to dig a bit deeper on, on a budgeting process. 
that uh, uh, connects the results with, uh, um, uh, um, uh, with uh, allocations. And the government of Kyrgyzstan has started to introduce program-based uh, budgeting as a way to um, uh, 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 bring additional results. So, Deputy Minister, can you tell a bit more about your experience and what opportunities uh, uh, could offer to the uh, conservation community? Спасибо, Масимилиона. Да, действительно, у нас с принятием бюджетного кодекса вот с 1 января прошлого года мы перешли на программное бюджетирование полностью вот по всем министерствам, ведомствам. И, естественно, это тоже создает больше условий именно госагентству охраны окружающей среды и другим министерствам, которые занимаются вот, <coughs> именно вот, развитием этой, этого биоразнообразия, потому что это дает им больше возможностей. И определять те приоритеты, куда э, точно направлять э, и эффективно направлять вот эти имеющиеся бюджетные средства. Я также хотел бы э, добавить, что <coughs> у нас э, в Кыргызстане, допустим, есть законы, естественно, как и везде, но я хотел бы привести пример. Есть закон о, о культуре, вот, допустим. И там в законе конкретно э, указывается определен, э, какое процентное, процентное соотношение оно должно иметь э, вот, финансирование вот, общих расходов государственного бюджета. Вот я думаю... Э, нам бы вот на охрану окружающей среды э, совместно с нашими коллегами, с парламентариями можно было бы инициировать и, допустим, не более трех или четырех, или э, вот какой-то процент, и, исходя из возможностей, э, определить, принять вот такой закон, по которому можно было бы спокойно, э, планомерно развиваться э, вот именно тем службам, которые занимаются этими вопросами. Кроме того, как я уже говорил в своем выступлении, да, действительно, кроме бюджетного финансирования, вот, у нас уже практикуется вот, именно привлечение частных инвесторов, а также вот, международных доноров, которыми я пользуюсь случаем, хотел бы выразить огромную благодарность за помощь, оказываемую нашей стране. Вот такие секреты финансирования охраны окружающей среды. Спасибо. Thank you, thank you, Deputy Minister. And on uh, continuing uh, our discussion on mainstreaming and the importance of the Sustainable Development Goals, how does the, um, the, your department, the Department of Environmental Affairs, see investment in biodiversity as uh, a way and means to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals? Okay. Thank you. Uh, as I indicated earlier on, we see a linkage or a contribution of the biodiversity economy uh, to the sustainable development goals. So if I let just look at the three integral principles that we see in um, sustainable development goals. Firstly, the principle of leaving no one behind, if we start with that one. Um, as a government, we have a priority around transformation, around social cohesion, and ensuring that there is equality. So if we then invest in the expanded public work programs that I mentioned earlier on, which both look at job creation, skills development, while still conserving and protecting our biodiversity, that's a key area in which financing in biodiversity can then uh, assist us in implementing sustainable development goals. I just want to pick an example on, on some of the benefits that we are seeing from these programs. So over and above the ones that I've talked to around jobs and everything, and also ensuring that we end up with clean, a clean environment, basically, which is around the protection and conservation part, um, there is also access to services that we are able to unlock uh, through these programs that we have. Um, key elements or components of our biodiversity economy are around the wildlife, uh, unlocking potential of the wildlife sector. 
And in this area, we're starting to see how do you get new entrants. So you look at enterprises that you can then start donating uh, wildlife to so that they then have economic activity. And that also contributes also to the economy of the country as a whole. So that's part of the areas that we're looking at as we, when we look at uh, investment in biodiversity. Because we're saying whatever investment we make in biodiversity, there must be real value for the communities. I made an example of our protected area strategy. Most of our protected areas are in communities that are very poor. So w the key question is how do we start ensuring that the communities around the parks who are actually the custodians of our biodiversity start benefiting uh, from, from the parks. So as we look at these uh, financing approaches, we need to say which are the ones that will ensure that we then involve these communities and they start to become economically active uh, and therefore improve their own li livelihoods. So this is the element of trying to not to leave anyone behind, to say let's improve the life of people. Everyone must benefit and their livelihood must then uh, improve. This will link closely to the issues of equality and prosperity because you're then also uplifting the, margin, uh, the people that were marginalized before or that were not uh, active uh, participants in the economy. So how do we then also bring them around um, and get them to participate in ecotourism as an example? Uh, also ensure that, as I said, in the wildlife area, there's issues around, the, I mean, they can benefit from hunting, from ranching, also production, secondary products from, uh, farm, from hunting or in material that they produce. So how do they also start benefiting from those? There are also elements that we're looking at around bioprospecting. So how do we then ensure that there is access and benefit sharing that will contribute not only to pharmaceuticals or nutraceuticals, but also the co cosmetic industry as a whole, so that we then improve in that area. The third principle is around um, increasing capital uh, for resilience and intergenerational uh, equity. So how do we restore our biodiversity, the programs around restoration, programs around research and development, generation of knowledge so that we know how to better improve and also build technologies that will improve our management of biodiversity and contribute uh, to the economy of the country uh, as a whole. Uh, we do have a principle around a radical economic uh, transformation in South Africa and we see biodiversity management as playing a role through the biodiversity economy and we do have a strategy that and uh, that we outline and has different activities that i would not be able to speak to all of those uh, in the session but we are open to have discussions even outside the meeting just to share some of the experiences that we have thanks for that and i think several of you highlighted this issue of integrated approaches that uh, is, is not possible to look uh, at biodiversity as a separate uh, item in the agenda, but it needs to be linked with people, communities, sectors, or even technology. And um, uh, I'm uh, uh, turning um, uh, um, to our last uh, panelist, La uh, Grande uh, about the experience and the challenges that, that you have uh, confronted with. Uh, um, uh, in your attempt to uh, um, to um, uh, to develop these uh, what we call uh, clean production agreements that are uh, a public-private form of par par partnership, so if you can elaborate a bit more on that, and also less, some lessons learned that you can share with the audience. Um, voy a, I will speak in Spanish again. So, um, el yo creo que el primer, quizá el, el desafío más importante, eh, lo mencionó hoy día en la mañana eh, Midori en su presentación, tiene que ver con este cambio, este cambio de mentalidad, este mindset, eh, y particularmente respecto a, a, a que hay que imaginar eh, cómo el sector privado se puede involucrar en los objetivos de biodiversidad, eh, 
o también entender que el sector privado puede tener objetivos eh, de biodiversidad similares a, a los objetivos del, del gobierno. O sea, yo creo que cuando uno, empie uno empieza a buscar oportunidades de alianzas público-privadas, hay que partir reconociendo que es posible que el sector privado más bien quiera sumarse a esta alianza y no, y no ser más bien un enemigo o alguien que, que va en contra de, de estos objetivos. Entonces, entonces el primer desafío yo lo pondría ahí, en el, en el cambio de, de mentalidad y, 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 y abrirse a buscar estas oportunidades de, de alianza con los privados. Segundo, eh, es buscar efectivamente cuál es la oportunidad. Y la, y la oportunidad, yo diría que tiene dos elementos básicos, que es eh, un, una, una oportunidad donde el privado puede ganar, o sea, un privado no va a entrar en una alianza público-privada de forma voluntaria si es que no ve un beneficio, no ve una oportunidad económica fundamentalmente o de reputación, alguna ventaja eh, para su negocio. Eh, y al mismo tiempo el privado también gana, porque el privado ve una, una oportunidad de avanzar en sus objetivos de, de política, en este caso... Eh, eh, aumentar la conservación o, o eh, incrementar las áreas protegidas, etcétera, etcétera. Eh, el, y el tercer desafío, o sea, primero el mind, el cambio de mentalidad, segundo, eh, efectivamente identificar esta oportunidad de ganancia en que los dos ganan, el Estado y los privados, y tercero, eh, cuando, ya, cuando identificamos esta oportunidad, el tercer desafío es, la, es construir es trabajar esa oportunidad en un, en un programa, en una hoja de ruta, en un estándar concreto, específico, con plazos, con resultados. Eh, y lo complejo ahí es que eh, este tipo de alianzas se trabajan de una manera, eh, de, de forma muy transparente y con mucha confianza entre las partes. A veces el sector privado no se siente cómodo, por ejemplo, negociando un acuerdo con la autoridad ambiental en la mesa, porque han tenido históricamente una relación más bien de un fiscalizador o alguien que aplica la ley versus alguien que la cumple. Eh, entonces, en ese sentido no es fácil eh, este proceso de desarrollo de la alianza y, y trabajar la oportunidad de una manera más específica para que realmente sea algo que resulte y que genere los resultados que, que queremos. El... Nosotros... Eh, yo diría que el, el, para hacer esta, para abordar estos desafíos tenemos un procedimiento eh, bastante estructurado de, de trabajo eh, que, que de alguna manera va yendo etapa por etapa, eh, incluso apoyando la etapa de implementación. O sea, cuando el, cuando el sector privado decide en el fondo, incorporar estas buenas prácticas, estas nuevas tecnologías, vamos acompañando ese proceso. Eh, pero fundamentalmente, yo diría que lo, lo principal de esto son dos cosas. Uno, que se trabaja eh, no con empresas individuales, sino que más bien trabajamos con sectores, por ejemplo, el sector turismo, el sector de forestal, eh, eh, o con territorios, por ejemplo, las empresas vinculadas a un área protegida, por ejemplo. Eh, y el segundo elemento es que el sector privado es el que invierte. No, es, no hay, un subsidio, hay un subsidio público a la coordinación o a la, o a la falla de información. Es como nosotros aportamos recursos para entender mejor el desafío, eh, facilitar el acuerdo, eh, bajar los costos de transacción, pero finalmente los que invierten los recursos son el sector privado. Ahí no hay un elemento de subsidio, por lo tanto, yo diría, ese es el gran secreto, porque eh, estamos ayudando a las empresas de alguna manera a convencerse de que es, es un buen negocio para ellos hacer esto. Eh, por lo tanto abordamos una serie de obstáculos o barreras que, que permiten demostrar que esto es así y que es también bueno para el, para el gobierno. Eh, el, tenemos muchísimos ejemplos, eh, eh, yo pre prefiero quizás no, no entrar en algunos ejemplos ahora, pero a, a, le abro la, la posibilidad de que hagamos una mesa de conversación en los próximos días o, o, o podemos conversar para contar muchas experiencias exitosas de, de acuerdo y también experiencias no exitosas, eh, fallas en que, no, en que no, no hemos llegado finalmente a un acuerdo y, a, eh, y lo cual también es, un, es una fuente de aprendizaje muy importante. Eh, gracias. Uh, many thanks and and I think we are we have reached our uh, our time and lunch uh, I think is is between us and. Uh, 
and, and you. So l let me first thank our panel here for their contribution and uh, for their insights and reflection. Um, these are our important highlights to, to, to start our conference and more a deep dive on the subjects um, and particularly on uh, public finance. So thank you, all of you, for having joined us and share your experience and reflection. Thank you. And thanks also to Max for moderating. So thank you very much to our panelists. Indeed, <clears throat> it's time for lunch. Uh, lunch is waiting for you outside. We will start promptly at 2 o'clock for our first set of parallel sessions. Um, those one group will be in here, the number four, and the other three are on this floor and upstairs. So leave a couple of minutes early so you can divine your way to your rooms. Once you go to the first one, you'll know where they are, but leave some time for that, two o'clock promptly, and we won't reconvene in plenary until tomorrow at nine o'clock. So wish you a good lunch and an enjoyable afternoon in your parallel sessions. I'll put up the schedule for the first set so you can see where they are, otherwise you need to use the app. So that's for session three, stream sessions, and session four. And I'll leave this up. Join us at lunch outside and see you again at two.